Let thy merciful ears, O oh Lord, be open to the prayers of your servants. That they may obtain the petitions, make them to ask those things that shall be pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 3 of hymn 691. While life's dark maze I tread, and griefs around me spread, be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn to day, wipe sorrow's tears away, nor let me ever stray from thee aside. Well, we turn to Kenneth Wiest's word studies in the Greek New Testament. Uh, I got this in 1975, and used it variously. Uh, it doesn't have a, a publication. First came out in 73. Goes back to 1950, 1955, 1944, 1953. And the edition I have is 1973, and I picked it up in 1975. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Oh, how the years passed. It's, 45 years ago, this has been traveling around with yours truly. Let's read the preface to see if there's any, what we can get out of it. Every book ought to have a reason for its existence. This volume is a simplified commentary on the Greek text of the gospel according to Mark. This also has in it Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, Romans, has other epistles to it, and then has Mark, which we're going to be looking at. The text of Greek Gospel according to Mark, written for the Bible student who is not conversant with the Greek language, furnishing him with terms which he can understand, all of which he should have for a more intensive study of Mark than any translation affords. So far as the author knows, there's no other book like it. Well, there's Dean Alford. Also, Nicole Robertson, I think. The additional material made available to the students in the form of word studies, an expanded translation which uses more English words than standard translations do, in order to bring out the richness of the Greek text, an interpretive material based on the Greek text, some original with the author and some culled from Greek authorities such as A.B. Bruce's Expositor, Greek New Testament, Marvin Vincent's Word Testament, and I think I got that around here too, Vincent's work. I need to check the shelves here. Barclay Sweet's work on Mark, Archibald Alexander, Word Pictures in the New Testament, I got him around here too. Making available to the student of the English Bible the rich comments of Greek scholars to which he does not ex have access. The authors made a careful translation, taking note of the tense meanings, which the standard translations do not bring out. That's good. See what he does in Romans. Always got to watch Paul and his verbs. There's tons of stuff bleeds out, not just in his verbs, but the other words too. The imperfect tense, so frequent in Mark, for instance, draws a picture. It's regularly rendered in standard translations as heiress, referring to the mere act, fact of an action. Consequently, the vivid picture of Mark paints is lost. That immediately, there's a price of the book moment, my friends. For those of you who know me, P-O-B-M, price of the book moment. When a page or a paragraph is so illustrative and lustrous that it justifies the purchase of the book right there, the imperfect tense throughout Mark. All these years, I've never heard that. We're going to see if that's the case because that imperfect tense looks back to action that's kind of ongoing, so there's a vivacity. Whereas the or, or eris kind of is past tense, just stops without suggesting the ongoing action. 
very, very nice. A POBM. The order of the words in the Greek text is preserved as far as possible, consistent with not a not too awkward English diction so that the student may see where the Greek emphasis Greek places the emphasis. Polished diction has been sacrificed in the interest of clarity and a closer interest uh, to the style and force of the text. Translation must not be used in the place of standard translations, thank you, but as a companion explanatory translation making clearer many of the English words which do not in themselves equal the total meaning of the Greek word. This book should prove useful to missionary translators, especially those who do not know Greek. How in the world you could be a missionary translator and not know Greek? Oh boy. It will enable them to make a far more accurate translation into the native tongue than is possible when the English translation is the sole basis of their work. Pastors, Bible teachers, Sunday school teachers, and all serious student Bibles <coughs> should find it helpful in quickly getting back of the English translations to a far more intelligent understanding of the gospel than they could obtain from the translation they are using. That's a bit of an overstatement. I don't like that. English translations are usually very good, accurate. King James is beautiful. Geneva Study Bible is excellent. Authorized Standard Version, NASB. Less so the NIV, less so the ESV. I kind of put those to the side. If I need technical details, just go back to the Greek and Hebrew. Finally, the book will open up to Bible student a portrait gallery of vivid word pictures of our Lord that Mark paints with Greek brush Pictures which, while accurate in translation, are not so vivid, clear, and impressive as those in the Greek text. Erasmus, the great humanist, a contemporary of Luther, says in the preface to his Greek Testament, these holy pages will summon up the living image of his, his mind, capital H. They will give you Christ himself, talking, healing, dying, rising, the whole Christ in the word. They will give him to you in an intimacy so close that he would be less visible to you if he stood before your eyes. The gospel according to Mark is preeminently the gospel of action, of pictures, of description. The student can study it through verse by verse. Okay. I'm wondering here if in the future we're going to need, I think we will, so give me a second to uh, pull up the Greek New Testament here. Uh, give me a second here. Um, I'm going to be cautious. Um, kind of as a student of Thomas Cranmer, I'll always be cautious and judicious. I know all this is coming up, but... Uh, even Arminius said that Calvin was judicious, and uh, we will be studying Arminian and Prof. Huxima, but that's, okay, there we go. Okay, beginning, Arche Angaleu Jesu Christ Tutheu, in the beginning, Arche, beginning, origin person or thing that commences, the first person or thing in a series, RK, the beginning of the gospel. It's going to take off with John the Baptist. Um, used without the definite article, showing that the expression is kind of a title. RK to Angelio Jesu Christu, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. In the beginning, not of Mark's book, but of the facts of the gospel. Mark shows from the prophets that the gospel was to begin by sending forth a forerunner. Each evangelist has a different starting point. Mark begins with the work of John the Baptist. 
Matthew with the ancestry and birth of Jesus the Messiah, Luke with the birth of John the Baptist, and John with the pre-incarnate word of the gospel. That's beautiful to focus on Arche to Angeliu. Angeliu, which means, what are we? We're evangelicals. <laughs> Not in some 20th century American sense, but in the sense of the New Testament evangelists. We say that in the Episcopal parable of the Gospel of Matthew, the evangelist. I guess that makes us evangelicals. Get all the cloud thrown around, high, low, broad, Anglo-Catholic, evangelical Anglican. We're evangelicals in the sense of the gospel here. Beautiful. Of the gospel, euangelion, a message of good news. This word was in common use in the first century for good news of any kind. The proclamation of the accession of the Roman emperor was entitled good news. The evangelists appropriate the, appropriate the word and take it out of current secular use and speak of the message as good news. Of Jesus Christ, I wonder how he's... Okay, I see where he's going here. Of Jesus Christ, Jesus, the transliterated, transliterated form of the Hebrew word we know as Yehoshua, which means Jehovah saves. I've seen some people not want to say that, but Christos, the transliterated form of Greek word, means the anointed one. In the first name, we have the deity, humanity, and atonement of our Lord. The second, the fact that he is the anointed of God to Israel, its Messiah. And remember, this becomes a point in his trials we read in Matthew 26 tonight at evening prayer. Are you the Christ? I adjure you, I adjure you, said the high priest to Jesus. He said, it is as you say. And he begins to scream. What further need do we have of witnesses? He's blasphemed. I think they use the word twice, two or three times. He's blasphemed. He's blasphemed. And then we get the story of Peter bugging out. Jesus admits under adjuration, that's a technical term, of a court which was used, which you swear an oath before Jehovah to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. That goes back into the study of Leviticus. So the high priest puts Jesus under oath and he swears that he's Israel's Messiah. These words are in the objective genitive. Very nice. Uh, I'd have to think about that. An objective genitive is something that where the noun has a verbal idea, the good newsing, the evangelizing, and the genitive receives the action. Or, uh, yeah, it's the good newsing about Jesus. You could take it that way. Or it could maybe be um, genitive content. It, that is the evangel evangelical message full of the content of Jesus, sort of like a glass of, of water. So he takes it as an objective genitive. And I like it when a guy takes an exegetical position, whether you agree or disagree, but at least it's nice and clear. The good news is not preached by Jesus. That's wrong. This is Jesus's canonical word we disagree here and that's the substance of exegetical controversy not contention to the point that you know we're not brothers no 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 the message announces him the son of God okay this title is implicit in the name Christ for the anointed of God is the son Therefore, its addition here must indicate that which Mark wishes to inform the reader that he will present our Lord from that point of view. The word son without the article in the Greek 
it is without the article. It's huiu theu. Emphasis is therefore upon the character of nature. <coughs> Jesus Christ is son of God by nature. That is, he proceeds by eternal procession from God the Father in a birth which never took place as to his deity because he always was, which we learn from John 1.1. 1, 1. By virtue of all this, he possesses co-eternally the same essence, homoousius, as God the Father. The article is present before the word God, is absent, I should say, before the word God, showing that absolute deity is in view. Translation, the beginning of the good news concerning Jesus Christ, Son of God. Okay. Now we're into one, two here. Kathos gegerptai entoches, how do you say it in English? Isaiah, this is Isaiah, to prophete, edu apostelo ton angelon mu pra prasopu musu, hos kataskiosai ton adon adonsu. Just as it has been written, there's the old gegraptai stuff, as it has been written, okay? Done back then canonically and authoritatively by God. Isaiah, the prophet. And this is such a big issue for the liberals. They cannot manage a God who predicts prophecy. Can't say that enough. Behold, I will send, or I am sending, Apostello. Let's see, I send the my angel, my announce, my messenger, before your face, who will, will prepare a future tense your word, your, your your way. I should say your path. One two, Kathos, just as. According as, even as, just as, the Greek word is stronger than the English verb, emphasizing accurate reproduction of what one has spoken or written, just as. It is written, kikaraptai, in the perfect tense, good. Speaking of an act that is completed in past time, that is, somebody sat and wrote Isaiah, right? Having present results, Okay, that works, is used here to emphasize that the Old Testament records were not only carefully preserved and handed down from generation to generation. Hallelujah for this guy. Of well, the first century, but that they are a permanent record of what God said. Oh, the Westminster Assembly of Divines would just delight in this. This is good stuff. They are in the language of the psalmist forever settled in heaven. Every word of God proceeding from the eternal decree before Adam and Eve. And I marvel over that. I don't fully understand the decrees. As we're reading through Jeremiah and the bad guys are getting hammered. And the elect are getting encouraged. But there's more bad guys than good guys. So, And they're made good guys by, by grace. They're not not Romanists. And yet in all that mix up and mess of called Israel's history, Isaiah's book is preserved with precision. This brothers, we're gonna be this is gonna be a slow read of four volumes, God willing. God give us strength and determination and perseverance. This is just beautiful. This We saw Gigraptai, just as it is written, over in Matthew 4, 1 to 11, when Jesus is accosted by the universal blockhead called Satan. That's what was Dr. John Gershner's word for him. In which Satan, with rudeness, stupidity, gross disrespect, malice, Assaults Jesus, the Son of God, and the temptation. Think about it. 
to venture into the presence of the Son of God, Jesus. Even try to tempt Jesus instead of submitting to Jesus. What does Jesus do? Gegrapdai. Pulls the sword of God's word out. Swings it. Gegrapdai. Three times in Matthew 4 to 11. And we get Gegrapdai here, just as it's written in Isaiah, prophet by the prophet. One can translate that it has been written with the present result that is on record, or it's that 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 alone, that alone is beautiful. He's got it exactly right, exegetically. In the prophets, no, 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 it's not in the prophets, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet. He's got a he's got a typo here. Sword can. Need to be edited here. The best Greek texts have in Isaiah the prophet. All right. Quotation is from Malachi 3 1 and Isaiah 43. As to the present discrepancy, here is no discrepancy. Robertson says it was common to combine quotations from the prophets. Bruce, in his expositor's Greek testament, says, and an inaccurately, doubtless but not through error of memory, but through indifference to greater exactness. No, it's, Bruce has got it wrong. It's a singular, whatever. So we find this among scholars. Behold, we'll move on here. Uh, behold, I, will, I send, behold is gives a peculiar vivacity. Take a look. By bidding the reader or the hearer, there it is over there, behold. Behold, I send my messenger, my angel. Could be angel, but it's messenger. It's just John the Baptist. I send, apostello, present tense, from oneself. The word is used in an early secular document in the clause to proceed with officers sent for the purpose. Apostello. Interesting. Uh, the word apostle is related to the word apostello. And I'd forgotten that. The, the sense of apostle is one who is an official ambassador. We think of diplomats, diplomats, the foreign service, of the, set, of the State Department that proceed in behalf of the foreign, the U.S. government to foreign governments to represent. Beautiful. Page two here, for those of you who know me, a price of the book moment. I think early on, if it's going to continue like this, brothers and sisters, get yourself a copy. You don't know Greek. He's hitting home runs. Yeah, that's, he's getting his exegesis right, except for the last little section. The sense here is that officers were commissioned to do something, and that's important. Think about John the Baptist that way. He didn't head out on his own. He was commissioned. We call them in the military commissioned officers who serve at the pleasure of the President of the United States. And you get a commission, get a commissioning document over on the other wall there. I was commissioned. I was sent by my church to represent my church in the military, commissioned as such. Wow. In Herodotus and the Septuagint, the noun form of this word is used as an ambassador or as an envoy. Thus, John the Baptist was an ambassador or envoy, re envoy representing God on a commission to perform certain duties. Messenger, angelos. In 2 B.C., in a 2 BC manuscript, envoys, whose names are given, the verb form means to proclaim. Thus, the word refers to a messenger who is an envoy bearing a message. The Greek word comes into English as the word angel, and so is given in its proper context. In some it means angel, others it means messenger. 
context determines how you work with that. Behold, I send my messenger, my ambassador. He, he misses the possessive pronoun, Mu. That is God's messenger. That's not a small possessive pronoun. God owns John the Baptist. Wow. Including John the Baptist's message. A tough guy. Not a snowflake. Gave practical stuff and practice and repentance. Go out and do this as fruits worthy of repentance to show a changed life. Which is a masculine pronoun in the original translated who. Okay, he's already skipped ahead here before my face. He skipped the whole clause. I will, behold, I will send my messenger before your face. And yours would be Jesus. Oh, he missed it. To prepare. Who will prepare? Katskiwase ten adon su. Katskiwazo used in the papyri with reference to the visit of a Roman senator to Phaeum. To prepare. Directions are given for his welcome. Take care at the proper places. The guest chambers are ready. The verb means to furnish, equip, prepare, make ready. I think I can illustrate it this way, that oftentimes when we were at sea for six-month deployment, um, we'd be getting ready to come back. And a number of times I was flown off the ship in the road to Spain, and then I'd pick up a plane and fly to Norfolk ahead of the ship. The ship would come in 10 days later, roughly, usually 10 or 11 days to cross the Atlantic, or kind of a casual 20 knots, 18 knots, 22 knots. My role was, as a chaplain, to go in advance and prepare everything for the ship's arrival. And that would often include work with the wives group, uh, working with the, the ombudsman, preparation for the ship's return. Now, I forget what all I had to do now offhand as it comes to mind, but I'd have sw swimmers, I'd have a couple of SAR guards, search and rescue on the piers. Because families would gather on piers, I was always worried about a kid going over, you know, getting away from mom, because they're young families, right? Young kids. Get away from mom and fall in the, the off the pier. Like Navy SAR guards there, if that happened. And then I'd have a bullhorn or some other thing. They'd, they had music that they wanted to play, national music. I was the guy who prepared the way for the ship's entry. John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus. And I think we better call it a day there. This is uh, going to, I think we got a home run with this book. Oh, wow. Wait till we get the Romans. He's hitting home runs like that. Uh, we have here a sermon by that good man, Horatio Bonar. Horatius Bonar. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest in your weariness. Lay down your head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, so weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. He wrote a very brilliant book on the book of Leviticus. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this man, Brother West, who's making your word come alive, and he's getting it so bright. Help us to think aright, think lawfully in a way that you are happy with. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Godspeed.